Okay. Okay, so good morning everybody and welcome to our fortnightly Thursday morning webinar with the Devon International Recruitment Hub. So my name's Carly and I'm the transition lead nurse for the Devon Alliance and we've got lovely Jack who a lot of, a lot of you will know. He's one of our recruitment partners and really pleased to introduce Natalie Bonds who's with us this morning. So Natalie is a tissue viability specialist nurse in one of our Devon hospitals up in North Devon, which is my neck of the woods. Um, she's come along today to talk to us about all things tissue viability. Um, so obviously as a trained nurse, this is a, a massive element of our role. Um, our grading systems will probably be different to what you're used to in your own country. So um, she'll be she'll be going live shortly and uh, doing some teaching. I hope you all had a great Christmas um, and Happy New Year to you all. I hope we've got some time to spend with families. Um, and remember our Nursing in Devon Facebook page. We've got a Nursing in Devon YouTube channel where all of our webinars are uploaded and are free to watch. So please give us a like, give us a love and give us a share. Tell all your friends about us. Um, pop any questions you've got in the chat and I will answer those as we go along. Um, and then if we've got a little bit of time at the end, I'm going to do a bit of mindfulness with you because I think January is such a busy time of year and it's nice just to be present in the moment and have that time out. So I'd like to introduce Natalie. Natalie's come along to talk to us about tissue viability. So over to you, Natalie. Hello, morning, everybody. I'm just going to try and share my screen with you all. Um, so bear with me for two seconds. I don't want to do it too early just in case it didn't work. Um, bear with me. Oh, two seconds. Is it gone? Sorry, just having a bit of a technical. It's not wanting to share my uh, presentation with you for some reason. Sometimes the screen share delays it's a bit. Yeah, it's literally just disappeared. It's got um, screen on my windows, but it hasn't got presentation. Good old technology. Yeah. I don't know why that's not coming up. Sorry, Carly, I can't actually. Do you want to email it over to me and I can screen share? Yeah, yeah, that's great. I'll do that. Oh, lovely, our attendees are climbing up. That's brilliant. Welcome, everybody. It's very cold in Devon this morning. We're about five degrees. We've had some new arrivals the last couple of weeks. Um, I hope everybody's keeping warm. OK, so we're just uh, having a few technical issues at the moment. Oh, Natalie, are you still there? Oh, Natalie, you're on mute. Sorry, yeah, I'm still here. Right, it should be with you now, the email. OK, right, you're, you're actually you're on screen now. OK, so I'm going to see if I can. Uh, right, just wait for that email to come in. See if you can screen share now. OK, let's have a little try. No, it's just not wanting to um, show it at all. 
OK, just waiting for that email to come in. Sorry, everyone. Hi. The practice run works and then this one yes. doesn't. Always away, don't worry. Emails on a go slow this morning. I don't know if you want to, um, just while we're waiting for that to come in, whether you want to start about just talking about your role, Natalie. As a yeah, absolutely. So um, my role here is as a tissue viability nurse. So we are an advisory service for the local district hospital, um, all the community nursing teams and the nursing homes. Um, so we cover quite a large area. Um, at the moment, there's three of us in our team. Um, one of them is one that's gone for us a comment, so hopefully she'll be back in six months, but we'll see. Um, so during our day to day um, activities, we see patients on the wards that nurses or doctors are concerned about. Um, and we tend to see the patients with the nurses so that they can have the advice with us. Um, and hopefully it's part of their sort of learning as well. Um, we receive referrals through emails or phone calls um, and we try to see people within sort of two working days of receiving that referral. Um, if it's within the community, we will contact the community nurses within sort of two days, but aim to see the patient within a couple of weeks. So it's good fun. Um, we see a like a wide range of wounds, really. Um, so we do say so like today I'm going to talk to you about pressure ulcers, but we do deal with quite um, substantial leg ulcers and um, post-operative wounds, but also the diabetic foot ulcers um, where we work alongside the vascular consultants and podiatry um, and we do a, what's called a diabetic foot clinic. So um, we see patients, they come to the clinic. Um, oh, looks like it might be working. So right. you, Carly, that's amazing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, so you can see that screen. So they'll all be able to see that. They Obviously, they they can just see that now, as far as yeah, I know. They can see yeah. Carly, if you click on that content and then send it live, at the moment, they can still see Natalie. Oh, you see still my face. Um, it's in the bottom right hand corner where it says you can see the presentation. Lovely. Stay. So, I haven't got that on my screen. No, I'll do it. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you. There, right, I'm so, fine now. Right. Thanks, Jack. Natalie, just let me know when you want to go to the next slide, OK? OK. Yep. Brilliant. Um, so obviously with, um, so if you go to the next slide, please, Carly, that'd be great. Um, so I can't any... believe that picture of me and Sarah Hill is still banging around. <laughs> On the front there. Oh, that was I know. It's a good one. It's a beautiful photo of you, Lit. <laughs> right, next slide. Okay. So, obviously, I know that things might be different um, where you are, but this is um, basically how we work it here. Um, but through this sort of presentation, what I want to go through is the structure and the function of the skin, um, the causes of pressure ulcers, why we get pressure ulcers, how we get pressure ulcers. Um, and how we grade them and categorise them. I also want to go through moisture lesions with you um, and also how we actively prevent pressure ulcers from happening. Um, it's a big thing um, reacting to pressure ulcers, but if we can stop them happening in the first place, then that's the best outcome, really. So if we could go to the next slide, please, Carly. So your skin um, is has three layers so you've got your top top layer which is called your epidermis okay this is just a few cells thick okay then that goes to your squidgy dermal layer so with your dermis that contains things like your sweat glands um a load of your nerves your hair follicles it's also got um your blood vessels go through as well um but this is the area that's really nice and squidgy but it is the area of your skin that gets um thinner as we get older um, and then under your nice squidgy layer, you have now got your subcutaneous tissue. So this is like your fatty tissue, which um, holds all your collagen and fibroblasts. All right. Um, a few statistics. The surface area of your skin is 1.5 to 2 meters squared, um, and it is your largest organ of the body. So next slide, please, Carly. Perfect. So 
there's so many different functions of your skin. So one of those is protection. So your skin acts as a protective barrier against um, damage to your internal tissues from, and that could be from trauma, bacteria, um, but also temperature and ultraviolet light. So it just, it is our um, main, main point of protection really from the outside world. So in your skin, you've got, um, lots of different nerves and this will be your pain receptors so with your nerve endings um it will tell you if you feel pain if you feel heat um so this is just really good part of your skin you've also got your metabolism so your skin um helps with the production of vitamin d um, which is important for your bone development. It's also producing of melanin um, and so it protects you from the sunlight radiation. Okay, next slide please, Kelly. So and it, you can communicate a lot through your skin. So this um, can be through colour of your skin, whether it's clammy and sweaty. Um, so you know if somebody's hot, but also when somebody feels really poorly and they go that real grey colour um, and real sort of clammy. So it, you know, you can sometimes just look at a person's skin to know actually if they're feeling well, if it's covered in rashes, if they've got loads of um, spots all over it, and you can tell general health as well through your skin. So also your maintenance of your body temperature. So because you've got your hair follicles on there and you've got your blood vessels through um, your skin, when the um, to warm the body, the blood vessels basically constrict, so it um, tries to keep those down. Um, the blood vessels tighter and to cool the body um, your vaso blood vessels will vasodilate so it will open up try and get that circulation through okay so next slide so what changes your skin so age so we've said earlier that actually your dermis will get thinner as you get older and um, therefore that gives sort of change um, so that actually you can get more trauma of your skin therefore more bacteria can get through okay um, Nutrition and hydration. So if you're poorly hydrated, your skin will become dry and again, it will crack. Um, different medications can affect your skin. So in particular, you've got steroids, whether that's systemic steroids or topical corticosteroids. Both of those will thin your skin. Um, you've also got illnesses, moisture. So we will touch on moisture later on. Um, but if you've got moisture constantly on your skin, that will cause your skin to break down. Um, chemicals, smoking, obviously, and temperature. Okay, so next slide, please, Kelly. So your skin. Your skin is acidic, naturally, so it's normally got a pH of 4 to 6.8. So this helps to stop bacteria from growing on the surface. So urine and feces are alkaline in nature. Okay, so if you imagine if somebody's incontinent of urine or feces and that is sitting on their skin that will change the ph of your skin okay soap is also an alkaline so if you imagine somebody is an incontinent of feces you then wash their bottom actually you think you're helping but in actual fact um you're making it even more alkaline than what it should be therefore this can help make your skin break down so it's really important when you are um cleaning somebody who is either incontinent of feces or urine that actually you use a pH balance cleanser rather than soap. Um, I was told once and it's always stuck in my head that actually every time you wash your hands you're changing your skin balance a thousand times more alkaline than what it should be um, and it actually takes 48 hours for your skin to recover from every time you use soap on your skin and um, so it's really important to change um, to a pH balance cleanser. And actually it's good for all of us to be using pH balance cleansers. Um, so the more alkaline is, obviously the more vulnerable your skin is to breaking down from shear and from friction. Therefore pressure ulcers are a lot more prevalent in somebody that is incontinent. Um, but if we could go to the next slide, please, Carly. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much all I've just <laughs> told you about. Um, but yeah, it's just really important to maintain that actually you do keep that skin clean, um, but also just to not try to add soap into the mix as well. Okay, next slide, please, Carly. So 
To prevent skin damage, we use um, a range of barrier products here and um, you guys might use different ones, but here we use um, Mediderma S um, and that comes in lots of different forms. So we've got um, a cream. So we use the cream on um, somebody who is incontinent um, or um, they've got very mild pressure damage, but actually you want some moisture in there as well um, to protect it. We normally say that actually this one should be applied um, every third wash. So it doesn't need to be put on every time you see a patient and clean them. It's just every third wash. Um, but with this one, uh, it's just a little goes a long way. So whereas normally we would say with emollients, you need to liberally apply your emollients. Actually, with the barrier cream, a little bit does go a long, long way. Um, we've also got ones that are films. Um, so they can come in a spray or the lollipop um, form. Um, and with these ones, these last even longer and can actually last up to 72 hours on the skin. So depending on how um, yeah. wet either the pressure ulcer is or the moisture damage is, actually you might want to bring that shorter, but generally they will last up to 72 hours. You also have one that's um, we called Mediderma Pro um, and that is ones that we use on severe moisture damage. So these are the moisture damages that where um, the skin is absolutely red, red, raw and looks more like nappy rash. Um, so that's what we use that one for. Carly, if you could just change the screen for me. So this is the products that we use. Um, as you can see with the Medidema Pro, that is um, a soap substitute. So we use that in the trust um, for cleaning patients, really. Um, so that is a really good um, pH balance cleanser. So Carly, can I go to the next one? This is all the information that um, we send out to the staff on the wards. Sorry for the background noise, everyone. Um, it is, um, so I can easily send these to Carly and Carly can distribute them to you if, if you feel that they would be beneficial. But this is just some education bits that we have on the wards, just so it's easy for the staff to actually think, right, which one am I going to put on this um, moisture damage or the pressure ulcer um, and how do I apply it? Okay, so next slide, please. I feel like you're like my glamorous assistant over there. Yeah, yeah I feel a bit like Debbie <laughs> McKee. <laughs> um, so these are just some pictures. I do. I will warn you now. I have got some beautiful photos to show you. Um, so this is just the start. So these are just various pictures of your moisture lesion. So as you can see, it is literally just that top layer of skin going from most of those, but actually it can go into your dermal layer. Um, so it's really important when you're looking at moisture and pressure to always think about the different layers of your skin and how deep this has affected them. Um, but you can see on the um, left hand top one, it's all a bit sporadic. It's all just a bit all over the place. However, in the middle top, you can actually see that somebody's put a dressing over that area and you can see that it's just marked where the actual dressing was. Um, the underneath at the bottom, you've got that what they call the butterfly or the kissing effect of moisture lesions. Often they're ring creases of the skin. Um, and actually, if you've got moisture one side, you're going to have it on the other if it's creased. So then you get that butterfly effect. The one on the top right is um, a little bit more difficult. That could, you could say that that's actually an unstageable pressure ulcer because it's covered in slough and it's probably right over um, the coccyx area. But that's where photos are amazing, but you also need that background um, information. You need to know if that person's incontinent or if um, if you're in all feces or if they're um, just a little bit sweaty. But also if that person's up and mobilising every two minutes, it wouldn't be pressure. Um, so it would be um, the moisture. So it is really important when you're assessing um, moisture and pressure damage that you do, in fact, have a really good look, but get that background history. OK, next slide, please. Thank you. So pressure ulcers. Um, the European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel um, define a pressure ulcer as a localised injury to the skin and all underlying tissue, usually over a bony prominence. As a result, pressure or pressure in combination with shear. So 
shearing is um, basically if you um, put your elbows on the table and keep them still, but just rock them forward and you can feel that actually your skin stays in the same place, but your bone in moves. So that's actually going to be causing trauma to the, your skin cells um, and actually can cause cell death and trauma that way. Um, but basically, if you've got a bony area pushing down on your skin, you're going to be starving your skin of nutrients um, and oxygen and everything that that skin needs to survive. Um, and basically, you're causing cell death. So if we can relieve that pressure through repositioning um, or elevating the limb off of the surface that it's pressing on, actually, then you can prevent the pressure damage from happening. And if you do get a category one, actually, we can prevent it from going to a category two. OK, um, so if we could go to the next slide, please, Carly. Thank you. So it is normal to have redness on your skin um, that blanches. OK, so this is when you press your skin and it um, turns white. All right. So if we were all to cross our legs or sit on the toilet, you get that normal capillary reaction of that red area. If you were to press that, it would go white. So if that didn't and it was non-blanching erythema, that is when we go to our category one pressure damage. Say so next slide, please. So category one pressure damage is when your skin is still intact, but it is red. And if you press it, it stays red. So um, with this one, you can imagine it's if you think of the layers of your skin and the picture on there shows you, it's just touching those top layer of skin. OK, so it's just affecting your epidermis. Um, it's maybe a little bit more painful to touch for the patient. You might find that it's a little bit warmer. Um, sometimes it is a bit harder or a little bit softer than um, the other areas of your skin. So it is. this is your first, first um, category. So if you come across this, please do something about it. If it's on a heel, elevate that heel off of the bed. If it's on a bottom, um, obviously just increase your repositioning. So if somebody's on four hourly repositioning, say you might want to increase it to three hourly repositioning or even two hourly. Um, but the main way that you're actually going to prevent this from happening is um, through repositioning. So next slide, please. If you don't, and the pressure continues, actually this will carry on to a category two. So this is where actually your skin um, breaks. So this could be a clear fluid blister. So it's where your top layer comes away from your second layer. So it's your epidermis coming away from your dermis. OK, yeah. so that intact clear fluid blister or it's that top layer of skin coming off. OK, you will not see any slough on a category two. Um, and um, there will be no bruising. If there's bruising, we would go to, to a different category. OK. Um, again, we would in, encourage you to, um, again, up your repositioning, look at the patient's diet, look at their nutrition. OK, what is their skin surface like? Is it quite a damp area? Is it um, dry and cracking? Do we need to be moisturising those? Um, but yeah, it, we also in our trust, we report all of these um, category ones and category twos. So um, if it's an untrained, um, they would have to get the nurse to come and have a little look. But also we report it onto a reporting system called Datex. Um, but obviously everywhere's different and your reporting systems would be different. Um, Carly, next slide. Can I just ask about that? Is there sort of a national um, guidance in terms of what has to be reported or is it dependent on what hospital you work for? Yes, so each each hospital does do things slightly different. Yeah. Um, however, you should all we should all be like looking into all the different categories. Um, some hospitals say that they don't want to report um, category ones when actually we report all of them. Yeah. Um, and it, it should be that you report all of them, but some people can somehow work around. So they say it's a diabetic foot ulcer. It's not pressure when actually right. probably still is pressure. Um, but yes, you should all report. What about moisture lesions? Yeah, that's the same. They should. Yeah. They should report it. Okay. Thank you. 
All right. So your category threes are when it's a full thickness skin loss. So we've gone past the category ones and the category twos that are just slightly touching the dermis. This is when um, it's full thickness skin loss. So you're going to be able to see the subcutaneous tissue at the, underneath. Um, you will not see bone or muscle or um, tendons at all, um, but you may well have slough present. OK, the slough won't be covering the whole of the wound, um, but you might also find that you get what's called undermining or tunneling. So this is where you get. Um, so like you can see on the top wound here, actually the wound goes underneath the skin and actually that undermines that skin. And sometimes you get little um, tunnels underneath as well so that you could probe. So it doesn't, it still doesn't go down to your muscle, tendon or bone. It's still in the skin layers, but actually they can be quite substantial and they can be quite deep. Um, not all category threes we dress. Um, we would suggest that you would put a barrier film around the outside. If, for instance, it was on a heel and somebody was bed bound, um, you may want to just elevate the heel and not dress the wound. Obviously, if you're going to have a wound like the one in the top, they're ones that you probably would want to dress um, and you'd probably you would want to pack that top area um, especially. OK, um, so it all depends on the patient and it all depends on the wound. So you don't 100 percent have to dress these ones, but when they become quite substantial, sometimes it is better for comfort and symptom control. Um, but as I said, if they are in bed and actually they are bed bound and it is on the heel, there's not a lot of point um, to dress that. Um, again, if you get one of these, we as a tissue viability team would come and see all of category threes um, in the trust. And if it's a patient that is in the community, we um, regularly review photos of these patients um, and we will um, get the community nurses to keep us updated. Um, these are a harm event. Um, if they happen in your care, um, we used to do what we called was a significant event audit on every single category three. Um, we don't do that anymore on every single one. However, we will investigate ones where we feel that actually they haven't been um, repositioned. They haven't had clear care plans filled out. They haven't had um, comfort rounding tools filled out, things like that. So um, if we feel that actually they haven't had the best care that they could have had, actually we would investigate those. Or if we feel that there is some learning to be had, um, but we don't do the significant event every time anymore. Right, next slide please, Kelly. So category four, so these are your beasts, okay? We really do not want these to happen in your care. Um, these are ones that will go down to um, muscle, tendon, bone, okay? These are deep. You, obviously on your nose, it takes far less time to, for it to go to category four than on your bottom um, because the skin on your nose is far, far thinner than on your bottom, but we still do not want these at all. OK, um, we would you have to dress all of these. They are usually quite odorous, quite highly exuding wounds. Um, you would need to protect the surrounding skin with a barrier film. Um, so with these sort of wounds, we would often say that we would in our trust, we tend to dress them with an Aquacel dressing or we may well put some negative pressure dressing on there to try and suck the wound from the bottom up. OK. Um, we would, as a tissue viability service, again, would see every single category four um, and we would be highly involved in these. Um, and if they were in the hospital, we would regularly see them. If they're in the community, again, we would go out to see them um, with the community nurses. Um, and then keep in touch with them through photos and maybe keep on going out to every few weeks rather than every week. Um, but yes. As you can see, they're not a nice wound to get and actually they're really painful. Um, and they, as we come to it later on, actually they can cause quite a lot of impact to the patient's life. Um, 
you know they're going to need care going home it may hinder them going home for a while they may end up having to go into a residential or a nursing home um, and actually it's just the cost of having a wound on your bottom really or on your body somewhere so next slide please and do you um how long does it take for these sorts of things to heal if ever it's really difficult so um some of these will never heal um, and that's often down to the repositioning and yeah. um, I had one chap I'll never forget when I'd um, hadn't long really been in tissue viability and I'd come from practice nurse background and um, so working in the GP surgery and I found it really hard this chap was in a nursing home they were trying everything and he was declining to reposition mm. they were thinking you know I can see his butter like all his um, internal structures in his bottom um so they asked for us to go out because they we were like their last resort mm. so when i went out to chat to him actually that was his only control that he had was to stop the nurses from repositioning mm. um and when i asked gave him all the information and actually explained to him that actually this if he doesn't reposition and he doesn't let the nurses dress this this would in fact get infected and most likely kill him yeah. um, and that was what he wanted he wanted it to kill him and um, that's always always stayed with me because yeah. that's and you know he did get his wish a couple of weeks later but um, if patients don't want to comply and don't want to take on that advice that and they have the capacity to make that decision yeah. that is entirely their choice and actually those ones quite often don't heal you know I've had mm. patients in the community and because they're paraplegic they don't feel it so they're not worried about it yeah. so they still sit on it and actually think well actually I just want to be out in my chair all day which I completely understand they want to get on and live their life but actually then they get category fours quite quickly and then you get them back and then they come back again so some people are like a little bit of a revolving door mm. um people that can comply you know you could with negative pressure we've healed some of these in sort of eight to ten weeks um you know really well um but obviously it's all down to the person's health in general um what their nutrition and hydration's like if they've got other um issues that can hinder the wound healing you know smoking is a massive thing for um, hindering wound healing um, and if people want to sit in their wheelchair and go out for a cigarette and refuse to um, reposition actually that will make it a lot lot longer to heal thank you right uh, so unstageables these are ones um it's in I'd say relatively new category. It's um, in the last sort of six years, I would say, that they've added this one, whereas before we would have put this as a category three. Um, but an unstageable now is a full thickness skin loss um, where you don't know how deep it is. So it basically means that the wound bed is completely covered in slough or necrotic tissue. So this will stay as an unstageable until um, it basically shows itself as to what category it should be so it could continue to be an unstageable forever and actually somebody hasn't got the circulation to heal that and um, say somebody who's got diabetes we wouldn't go to briding that we would leave it dry and quite often they will just stay necrotic um, but other ones um, like the bottom ones they would debride and actually you would then categorize them what they are when that sloughs and dead tissues um, come off. Quite often these go to a three, um, but in the past we have had patients where they it is covered, like the ones in the bottom. You debride it and actually underneath that goes all the way down to their bone. Right. So um, we've had quite a few, you know in the past people coming in from their homes and they've had these and within sort of a couple of days they are actually a four. Um, so it is a difficult one but we do keep these as a unstageable with these again the tissue viability team will come and see every single unstageable in our trust um, and we will review them every week while they're in hospital um, and we will get updated photos from the community nurses every two weeks for these
And okay. is, um, is it debridement? Is that the favourite part of your job? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I love I love doing all that, all the messy, yeah. all the mucky business. Yeah. yeah. Um, but obviously with these, we just wouldn't want everyone just going to bridle them because if they are on a limb and actually they've not got the circulation to heal it, actually we can make the situation far, far worse. Whereas if it's on the bottom and actually, yeah, we could debride that, put some honey on that, put some larval therapy on it, you know, something like that. Actually, we can get those healing and feeling looking beautiful. <laughs> yeah. All right, next slide. So this is your deep tissue injury. So deep tissue injury basically looks like a bruise. Um, so this could be your blood filled blister um, or basically where the skin looks deep purple in the middle with a maroon um, or a lighter red around the outside. Um, so these pictures show them perfectly really. These used to be um, categorised as like a category two because they were just a blister or the top layer was coming away from the second layer. But in actual fact, these often went to category threes and the wards or the community nurses would be really upset because they think, you know, we've done loads of stuff, but actually the damage was already done. Um, so again, these stay as a deep tissue injury until uh, the depth and the extent of the skin loss is um, shown again and um, so we can categorize it properly again some of these just resolve on their own and actually they just go off and they don't cause a wound but some of these do go through to becoming a category three and that's not through the fault of um the people that have implemented the extra care or the repositioning it just means that that damage was already done when they came in and um, quite often you get these from patients that have had long lives at home um, so if they've fallen at home and actually they've not been able to get any care or support and they've been there for a few hours um, or days in some cases, unfortunately, they do come in with these deep tissue injuries. Again, as a tissue viability service, we would see these um, straight away. We would also see them in the hospital every week and in the community, we would get up to date photos every two weeks. Alright, so next slide. Oh, baby. I know, I know. This is just basically to show you that actually pressure damage can happen to any age. It doesn't just happen to old people. OK, anybody who is um, can be at risk of pressure damage. And this just goes to show this is um, a newborn baby who had one of the pulse oximeters on their foot. Um, and actually the pressure from that actually did cause a uh, category three pressure damage, um, which is quite substantial on a newborn baby. Um, but it also rings back really that if you think we we have probably all had pressure damage in our lifetime and um, but we don't even realise it. So I love my beautiful heeled shoes. I, you know, always before like good old COVID and you could go out more I would love to wear my heels but they would cause me blisters so if you think about it that is sheer and sheer and direct pressure so they are category two pressure damage and also if you think that are so painful and um, you know these patients can have massively substantial category twos um, and they can have multiple all at once so it's just to think actually it doesn't have to be an old person it could be absolutely any age whatsoever um they are so they are so um we do have a thing with also um in maternity units because quite often people don't think that actually they they're fit healthy ladies that are coming in to have a baby but in actual fact we're giving them an epidural um or a general anaesthetic and actually so then they may not feel their limbs they're not as active as they were and actually they are at risk of pressure damage so um that is just something else to think about is what we do to our patients that can cause the pressure okay. next slide please this is just some beautiful photos um just to show that actually it doesn't just have to be on the bottom on the heel on the elbow actually you can get pressure damage on the front um so this one is from a patient that had their legs crossed all the time um, but also you get the ones from the long lies at home and they can be all up the front of the body um, even on your forehead <laughs> so if I can get the next slide please Carly so this is the other leg 
so uh, they had their legs crossed. OK, so this would be an unstageable. OK, next slide. So like, as we touched on earlier, so the cost to the patient. OK, so this is your if they've got pressure damage, actually, they will end up with longer stays in hospital. They will probably, um, especially with the category threes and fours, they will need to have care at home. Um, so this may be the fact that they would have to go to their local GP practice to have these dressed or it means that they've got to um, allow a nurse to come into their own home and have these dressed and for some people they find it very very difficult to let somebody that's a stranger to them into their home um, but also it's just the effect of having a wound so having that feeling of an like an adhesive dressing or a bandage on their skin. Um, also the fact some of these are a bit odorous. Um, so it is, some people get very embarrassed by having that. Um, and it's also, you know, the pain, um, just generally, it's just not very nice is it having a wound. So next slide, please. So these are quite old figures, but I just wanted to talk to you about the cost of actually having a pressure damage. So these are, and like I said, really old figures, but on average, they say that a category one would cost around £1,214 to treat, um, whereas a category four would be £14,108 to treat. OK, so that's quite a substantial difference and actually um, it's a substantial cost to the trust that you work for. Um, and a lot of these, you know, are preventable, you know, so it's a cost that didn't need to happen. But we'll put these figures into perspective. So if we can go to another slide, please, Carly. So this is just to show our trusts. So all the healthcare acquired pressure damages that occurred in our trust between um, April 15 and 2018. As you can see, we mostly um, reported category twos um, and they're always above the ones so we would always say you know we would much rather that that was the other way around that we reported far more ones caught them before they became twos um, and then treated them that way but as you can see on the bottom you could we've got a few bumbling around of the greens so that's your category threes but luckily we don't get many um, category fours but they are there and actually we just really don't want them there. OK, so we really want to prevent those. So next slide. So this just puts it into statistics. So this is just one year of those. So this is when our trust included um, another trust um, nearby. Um, and as you can see, in that year, we got 332 category ones, 798 category twos, um, 114 healthcare acquired category threes and 11 healthcare acquired category fours. So all in all, we had 1,255 healthcare acquired pressure damages. OK, so if we go to the next slide and we think about that <coughs> money values of those. In that year, we spent £403,048 on a category one pressure damage. And we spent hundred hundred and fifty five thousand one hundred and eighty eight on a category four. Obviously, you can see the category twos was substantially um, more and so was the threes. So if you add those all together for our next slide, that's a humongous amount of money that the trust has paid out for healthcare acquired cash, um, pressure damage. And if we think a lot of that is preventable, so we're not you know, the patient shouldn't have had to have gone through what they've been through um, with having a wound, but also that's a substantial cost to the trust and that money's got to come from somewhere. OK. Next slide. So these are just to show you that actually um, there is a lot here about um, suing people for pressure damage. So um, one of my colleagues, their mum, found um, the pair picture in her Saga magazine and it's basically encouraging you to go and see a solicitor if you've had pressure damage so that you can sue the trust. Um, but also the other one is um, a picture of Christopher Reeves, who was the original Superman. 
So he had his horse riding accident and um, broke his neck, but he that wasn't what actually killed him. It was actually a category four pressure damage that killed him. Mm. Um, so, you know, they, they like to say, you know, if a pressure ulcer can kill Superman, then, you know, what hope have we got? Yeah. But it's just good to say that actually it can affect anyone. Um, and these are just some beautiful pictures of a range of different um, pressure ulcers. And you can see that bottom right hand one. Actually, if you were to put a probe in that wound, it went all the way back to where those pen markings are. Right. So it can look like a tiny little wound on the outside, but actually when you open it up, it's quite substantial. Mm -hmm. So next slide, please. So it's really important to assess your risks for your patients of getting pressure damages. Um, they assist with your clinical judgment, but they do not replace it. OK, um, it identifies different risk status and um, hopefully in turn it will help you to reduce the risk because it will highlight different areas that need um, improving. Assisting with care planning. So if you know that actually somebody is bed bound, then actually you might think, OK, let's put them on the comfort rounding tool and we will reposition them every um, two to three hours in the daytime. OK, or actually this person's um, can't feel their feet. Let's move their feet every couple of hours or put them in a heel trough or elevate them on a heel um, on a pillow or something. They do assist with audits um, and allocate appropriate equipment if needed. Um, I'll come on to equipment in a minute. So if we can have the next slide. Um, this is just an old copy of our risk assessment. <coughs> it has been altered a little bit since this one was done, um, but this just highlights different areas of how we would risk assess a patient, um, looking at how mobile they are, what the moisture of their skin is like, if they've got any neurological problems, um, their nutritional status, if they've got any vascular disease and also mental capacity. So then what we would do is we would tick whether they were low, medium or high um, and work our care plans on from that. Next slide. So prevention. Prevention is better than cure. So um, we would always advocate somebody has an individualised pressure ulcer care plan in place. Um, the type of mattress um, and different equipment is again put in place. So, you know, we use static um, memory foam mattresses generally. We do have the Airwave or the dynamic mattress. Um, we use the Duo 2 in our trust. Um, with those, we would say actually they don't prevent um, pressure damage from happening on a duo two. Uh, they, a recent study was done um, nationally and it looked at whether a airwave or a, um, was better than a static foam and actually they showed that it, there was no improvement. Um, the only thing that actually they would find is that if somebody was in bed for more than 20 hours a day and they already had a category three or four, that actually that patient would need to be, um, might find that they healed a little bit quicker than on a static. Um, but you've also got to think that sometimes people can't reposition themselves on the airwave mattress um, and actually are you causing more harm than kids? Some people just don't like the feeling of them, but also you still have to reposition the, bit, the patient just as much on an airwave mattress as you do on a static, which some people don't realise and actually they just um, think, oh no, they're on an airwave mattress, we don't need to move them quite so much, but that is false. So you and do you think about the cost of these airwave mattresses. You know, if we have to hire them in, yeah, it's huge, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So we would advocate for comfort rounding. So um, going and just checking on a patient, offering them food and drink, repositioning them um, in a timely manner. So whether that's two, three or four hourly um, or whether it's just to get somebody who's is actively mobile but you can't put around them just to say oh do you want to just stand up give your bum a little wiggle because that will all help um think about your barrier products if you need them um 
and anything um, you can consider relevant to your patient's assessment. OK, so next slide. So this is a copy of a really old comfort round, um, but this would just show you that actually when we do go to see somebody, um, we would say how often they're being re repositioned, why we're comfort rounding them. So not everyone's comfort rounded just for pressure ulcers, but actually they might be um, on comfort rounding so that they get nutrition or because they're a fool's risk. Um, but on here, it will highlight that actually, if somebody's got pressure damage, what category that is. So if somebody, say, has got a category two on their elbow, that will highlight on here. Um, but also on here, we've got things like taking somebody out to the toilet, um, whether you've offered them a drink, um, whether they need troughs or anti-embolic stockings and things like that. And obviously okay. this is a comfort rounding chart for Northern Devon, but all the other, depending on which hospital you go to work at in Devon, there will be something similar to this. Um, there will be a comfort rounding chart. It might just look slightly different. Yeah. So this is our Datix reporting system. Um, so on here you would um, state whether it was acquired on your ward or whether they came to the to your caseload with it, what the category is, where on the body it is, what you're doing about it, what things you've put in place for it. Um, also, it would be it's really, really good practice to take a photo if the patient um, will let you take a photo. OK, and they can send to that because actually sometimes you know, we all get things wrong sometimes. And if you say, actually, I categorise that as a two, but I've attached a photo, but then I get to, because we look at every single data to do with pressure damage, um, I would review this. And actually, from the photo, I might say, actually, no, there's slough present on there. That's a category three. So actually, if they came to your ward with it, already a three, and you've taken a photo of it, just... We can change that because otherwise it looks like it's happened on your ward if then they went somewhere else and it's a category three. Yeah. So sometimes photos are really helpful just to make sure that um, we can show that actually that looks the same when it came to you as it did when it left you or we can show that it's improved since it's been in your care. OK, so next slide. So this is just to show that actually if you're sitting correctly, um, normally about 75% of your weight goes through your buttocks and your thighs, about 19% goes through your feet, 2% through your arms and about 4% on your back. OK, so this is a chair that's really right for you. It's got the armrest, it's got, um, you know, the high back, everything like that. So if we go to the next slide, everything can change depending on your chair. So if you don't have armrests on your chair, it will change the amount of weight that's going through your buttocks and your thighs and your back. If the um, you know if the chair's too high for you, actually, then you're not getting that pressure through your feet. If it's too low, actually, you're going to be increasing um, it on your sacrum. If it's too deep, actually, you then slide down and you cause that tilted pelvis um, and you get that friction. And if it's too wide, obviously, it's got the stability. So if we go back, so if we go to the next slide, it will show you the last lady. So with this lady, so if we say, OK, that chair fitted her, but actually she's got a category one on her bottom. I know, let's put a pressure relieving mattress in like cushion on there so all the good thinking you're thinking right yeah I need to change something put a mattress in can you see that actually that's made the pressure far worse because we've actually tried to put a cushion in you then think well actually she's now not got the armrest so she's going to lean to one side and you can see that that again has increased the pressure dramatically on her thigh okay so then we've put a um, foot plate underneath, but it's still a little bit more pressure than it was originally. So this is just to point out that sometimes when we try and implement something, we can make it worse. And it's just to look at the whole picture, really. Um, so we don't advocate um, the use of these cushions um, 
generally they used to I remember when I was community nursing everybody had a pressure ulcer cushion everywhere um, but now it's just really assessing that whole patient um, and just thinking right actually can we just reposition could it have a chair that's already got the pressure relieving in it rather than adding to it um, but it's just food for thought really so if we have the next slide so this is just a really good saying, I think, um, and it is a dangerous saying. Um, so we've always done it this way. So this is the way we're just going to keep on doing it. It's really good to um, open your eyes and look at things from a different perspective and think of different ideas of how you could change pressure prevention. OK, and then the next slide. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not Mission Impossible. We can do this and actually, you know, with just a little bit of um, extra thought, actually we can prevent so many pressure damages and um, prevent patients going through that pain and discomfort and actually, you know, the annoyance of having a pressure ulcer. Um, and I think that is me. So thank you all Lovely. for listening to me, Babylon, yeah. about pressure well, damage. Right, hopefully I've, um, I've stopped sharing. Um, <laughs> Let's just, um... Has anyone got any questions that they're putting through to Carly at all? Um, let's have a look. Look at the questions. Um, what does it take to become a tissue viability nurse? Good question. Oh, well, that is a good question. So, <laughs> strong stomach. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but basically, so my progression into tissue viability, so I was a ward nurse for a couple of years. I then went on to be a community and practice nurse. Um, I did, I, I graduated with a diploma, so part of my converting to a degree, I did do the tissue viability module, um, which is a really good if you're thinking of getting into tissue viability to try and do that module because I learned so, so much from it. Um, but really, you've just got to be keen um, on tissue viability and just love wounds. Um, I think that's definitely a big part of it. We've had one of my colleagues has come over from sexual health, but she had a massive interest in tissue viability. Didn't really know anything about tissue viability, but actually she's now thriving and doing really well as a tissue viability nurse just because she's got that drive. She's got that keenness for wounds and to making a difference and it is that job that actually it is amazing because you can make such a difference to somebody without having to rely on um, doctors and things to do everything um, for you so it is it's good there's lots Definitely. of different ways and the only other question is what's the difference between a dermatology and a tissue viability nurse good question so um tissue viability we tend to look we do teach look at the skin um, um, and look at sort of basic rashes, but it's more to do with wounds um, and things like that. So your surgical wounds, your diabetic foot ulcers, your leg ulcers, things like that. Dermatology will look more at different rashes and continual rashes, but they will also look at things like malignancies um, and look at like moles, for instance. I wouldn't be going to assess a mole whereas you might go to dermatology for a biopsy of a mole or have it removed and um, so that is the difference so they tend to look more at the, definitely the skin and lesions on the skin whereas we're more wounds fantastic brilliant that's it for the questions natalie so a massive yeah. thank you for coming oh, on thank today. you for having me really really good presentation about tissue viability and you know it will just be it will just give our international nurses a really good idea of our um, assessment criteria in terms of our grading system um, and have a look at you know some of the paperwork and things so really yeah. really helpful yeah. oh well thanks for having me and i'll oh, leave you guys thanks. to it have a good day natalie bye, bye. Okay, guys, so we're ju we've just run over a little bit now, so um, I will pick up some mindfulness on our next webinar. So obviously our next webinar will be in a fortnight and will be a recruitment focus um, and then we'll pick up a, um, some mindfulness at the end of that. And then the one following that will be a webinar about the NHS pension, which I know is a question that a lot of you ask. Um, 
so we've got a pensions officer coming along to talk about that so i hope you all have a great day thank you jack for facilitating um and we will see you all in a couple of weeks take care everybody bye